and he's a wonderful trainer. I don't know if any of that has been captured digitally. Yeah, I need to lock John in a room and, and <laughs> film him at some point. Um, but those protocols are really neat and really detailed and really rigorous. Um, and now uniformly applied across all of the data in almost all of the North American Natural History Museums. So I think that's really the shining example to look at. Yeah. And there's, you know, I can send you a reprint of a paper that documents exactly how that, that, uh, those data were derived. So, yeah. But basically for Jeeva, you can't really rely on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so everybody comfortable with the geographic view? I'm kind of showing you the same thing three or four times this morning, but I think it helps to show it in different ways. Notice that this is not a map of completeness. This is a map of just data density. Okay, I didn't get that far. So now let's, let's look with respect to environments. So I had those points. And for each of those points, remember I've got raster data layers that summarize dimensions of climate. And so it's pretty easy in most GIS programs to essentially extract the value of a raster to the point and essentially characterize um, the environment of each of those points. I did that and I also created, I think it was 10,000 random points. And so they just covered the whole country. And similarly, I characterized their environments. And so all I'm gonna do is produce a cloud that is all of the environments represented across Kenya. And on top of that, all of the environments represented across the parts of Kenya that have been sampled. So I had 27,440 occurrence records after all of this reduction process. I had my 10,000 random points. And I just looked at three dimensions of the environment. And I can produce plots like this pretty easily. The brown spots are where we have bird records. And the blue, which is behind the brown, wherever you see blue showing through, those are sets of environments where no bird records come from. Okay? And you have to be a little careful of this because you can't see how many points are overlapping. But basically we can see some really sparse areas, okay, in environmental space. Basically what we're saying is relatively few areas that are humid in Kenya, right? They have a lot of precipitation. Down here, notice, that's a lot of pixels. That's a lot of points, okay? So we, it may look like small areas, but it's a lot of pixels across the country. So essentially what we're seeing is some areas that have fairly high annual mean temperatures and fairly low annual precipitation as gaps. We can look at precipitation and elevation. And what we see is that kind of at moderate to high elevations, we get a decent spread. But at low elevations, we see more and more gaps. Okay, this is just eyeballing it. You can do this quantitatively. And I can look at temperature and elevation. This decreasing relationship is called the adiabatic lapse rate. If you go up in elevation, it gets colder. Um, it also has to do with how the climate coverages are interpolated. So part of it is artifact and part of it is real. But again, what you're seeing is low elevation areas that are hot, okay? So then I can identify those combinations and ask where are they in geography? And so those gaps that I just showed you fall in areas like this. So in this case, what we have is spatial gaps and environmental gaps pretty much coincident. 
okay? Very elegant would have been if, you know, right here, we had an environmental gap. Um, but essentially, this is, this is just playing with data. I'm pretty terrible at formal statistics. I'm pretty terrible at a lot of things, but I, I really enjoy and I really learn from playing with data. So, this is one example. You know that big gaps remain in taxonomic, spatial, environmental dimensions, uh, even for birds. And you would kind of think that a country like Kenya that has a lot of tourism and a lot of kind of awareness of a taxon like birds, you would think that more of the country would be documented, but there are huge gaps. Um, and I will bet you, anybody in this room, maybe excepting the South Africans, uh, but I'll bet anybody from north of South Africa that you'll find the same results, the same sort of results. So remember this slide. The whole sequence of getting from biodiversity to usable information. Each one of these arrows is a link, is a, is a leak, okay? And what we've seen is, well, we know that there was a big mess here as far as taxonomy. I haven't really sorted out why there were South American birds in Kenya. Um, I need to, if I were to pursue this further. And I don't know also whether there aren't Kenyan birds in South America. So there may be more data out there for Kenya that somehow got lost, okay? But we know we have a leak here that's big. <coughs> Digitization, I guarantee you, you have massive leaks for Kenya. We'll talk about one of those in a moment. The data cleaning aspects, so, Essentially, imagine you're trying to get water supply from here to the next building. And imagine you have these big gashes in that pipe. Most of your water is flowing out and not getting to the other building. So here's kind of the picture. The data issues that were flagged in the GBIF extract is this little tiny sliver. The non-standard names are this brown piece, this weird set of taxa that aren't known from Kenya are this gray piece. Records lacking georeferences are the green piece, and the piece that I can actually use is the blue one. So this to me is actually a pretty optimistic picture which is to say, it should offer us some hope. If we just sat down, it wouldn't take terribly long, if we just sat down with the GBIF data, distilled it down to a list of unique localities and sat down with the Gazetteer of Kenya, we could double the amount of usable information. That's awfully cool. It might be a week of work, and you double the amount of information you have. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a, an ugly picture. It's, you know, the, excuse me, but the unwiped behind of biodiversity data, right? But it's got a lot of hope because without leaving this room, we could do quite a bit to improve it. I could track down these names and increase the usable information maybe by 50%. And I could sort out this mess, and I don't know if that would improve or not the picture, but I can certainly do this and I can double the amount of information that I have. Okay, so what do we do to fill those gaps? If Jesse or Joseph wants to develop a, uh, you know, Birds of Kenya based on good, broad, even coverage, how would you do it? 
the first step is obvious. You plug those leaks. So I would check and fix the taxonomy, quality control and error check, and georeference. Second level gets a little bit harder. Who else out there has digital data and is not sharing it? And so, for example, very obvious example is National Museums of Kenya. I was there a couple months ago, and they're very proud, and they should be very proud, that they've just finished um, capturing all of the data on the National Museums of Kenya bird data set. 50,000 records. Good quality specimen documented records. That's really cool. So you got to find those digital data and figure out what the problem is. Sometimes it's just somebody needs, you know, an invitation. Sometimes people need to be begged or bought. Okay. You know, essentially, when we put together the Ornus Network, I think it was 38 institutions came into the, the bird network for North America initially. Um, maybe a third of them were very eager and signed up right away. And a third of them, we kind of had to debate and argue, and eventually they came around. And then there was a portion of them that fought it and hated it and, you know, complained and whined, but it's the modern world. Um, so you've got to track down those digital data sets. Third is you've got to figure out where the analog data sets are, the non-digital data sets. And this is actually a pretty easy question to answer. What European nation was the colonial power in Kenya? Let's think about it. And what single institution have they stashed all of their million bird specimens from around the world? The British Museum. As of the last update that I had from the British Museum bird collection, again, they have about a million specimens, not including egg sets, so more than a million specimens. Um, and of that million, 15,000, give or take a few, are captured digitally. So now the question for you is who captured those 15,000 records digitally? to start off the computerization effort for the British Museum. Give you two guesses. <laughs> we and our students. <clears throat> Literally, we needed the data for the atlas, and we just went in. Maybe it was about a month and a half, all told, between the various teams that went in. Yeah. Yeah. Three or four months. Okay. Teams yeah. of four people. Yeah. And so, you know, basically you just go through the whole collection, the million birds. And obviously when you get to, you know, some family that's endemic to Africa, you jump over it. When you get to some family that's in the Americas, you have to go through, you have to know the list of species or genera that are in Mexico. Focus in on those and check each one of them. Months and months of work. But the pitiful thing is, these are institutions that are existing in the 21st century, and they're not making a broad commitment to capturing digitally everything. Somebody sent me a link recently, I think I put it on the Facebook page. There was a symposium from, from the British Museum about you know, essentially biodiversity informatics at the Natural History Museum. And I'll admit I didn't listen to the whole thing, but I scanned down, oh, okay, there's the iCollections initiative. It looked like the, um, whatever the grand plan for digital capture of the British Museum collections. 
So I thought, okay, we're going to look at this. And so I clicked on the presentation, and literally the first three sentences were, you know, there's lots and lots of work to do. We have to start digitizing our collections. And so the iCollections initiative is focusing on Lepidoptera from Britain and Ireland. That's it. So I really find this very irresponsible. Not just the British Museum. There are American museums, there are European museums, <coughs> museums around the world. It's part of the modern world to develop a digital catalog and to share it. So um, for Kenya, the obvious one is the Natural History Museum. And then you have to track down the others. Where are they, who are they, and what does it take to bump them into this task? Um, one possibility that a group of us is exploring is Think about the following. If I am setting out to uh, capture digitally a non-digital collection of birds, birds are very awkward. With herbarium sheets, you can just basically pass them under a scanner and boom, 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 boom. It can work very fast. But bird specimens are three-dimensional, and then they have these silly little tags that are like this, tied to the bird's feet. Okay, and they usually are written on both sides of the tag, and they can have, I've seen specimens with five or six tags. So there's a lot of information there. So if someone were to apply for a grant to capture the British Museum collection, or the British Museum's Kenyan holdings, digitally, the first task is just to get those labels captured. And that basically requires careful human hands. There's no way to build a robot. There's no way to automate it in any way, shape, or form. And so if you got that grant, however much money it is, almost all of the money is going to be spent on people, which is to say almost a little bit of the money would be on cameras and computers, a few thousand dollars. You know, if I'm replicating what we did for the Mexican data, let's say teams of four, two to four laptops, couple of cameras, not much more than that. So a couple thousand dollars maximum on equipment. Everything else is going to be spent on people. And hiring technicians in Britain is certainly going to be expensive. But you guys, and maybe undergraduates that you supervise, you have people power, just the way the Mexicans did. And so a very interesting partnership might be for geographically coherent sets of developing nations to partner with the institutions that are holding the non-digital specimens and say, we'll put up the people, you provide all the training you want in handling the specimens, and you provide access to the specimens, and maybe help us with like lodging and things like that, and we can make this work. It would be cheap. Okay. So the question is, um, can we form those alliances, like maybe a West Africa alliance, to go and capture all the West African data from the Natural History Museum, or East Africa, or Southern Africa, or Madagascar. Um, the second question is, can we find that bit of funding that's needed? Probably. And third question is, will the big institutions with non-digital collections accept? Probably. So that's kind of an interesting thought about how to solve some of these toughest questions. And at some point, I got into trouble last week for putting this forth, because one of the participants thought that that was irresponsible of me. I love field work, okay? I'd love to be out.
doing field work right now. I'm not saying that you wait until you've captured the holdings of the British Museum, but you should do the easy stuff as quickly as possible and fold the field work in, obviously when you can, but that field work is gonna be maximally effective when it takes advantage of the existing knowledge. Okay, so that's the example for Kenya. And now I'm gonna start shutting up and you guys are gonna have to start starting some discussion. <laughs>